Well, good morning. Would you stand with me? Welcome. For those of you that have tuned in, the same. Welcome to you as well. What a beautiful day, huh? Absolutely beautiful. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we bless you. It is a beautiful day. One that you've created as your words is for us. Thank you, Lord. And we do choose to rejoice in you. We're so grateful, God. Grateful to you for, for so much. For the seen and the unseen, God. It's things that you do for us, with us, that we're not aware of, but yet we're blessed by. God, we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. We're gathered here because of you. The word says that when we come together in your name, and we lift up your name, we exalt you, we praise you, we worship you, that you will draw us close. That's our prayer, that you would draw us close this morning. Close to you and close to each other. Thank you for the opportunity to fellowship and to gather. Lord, have your way. By your Spirit, Holy Spirit, bring us word of the Father and teach us to be like Jesus. May we be a blessing to you today, Lord, as your love flows through us, and we also be a blessing to one another. Bless the households that are represented here, Lord. The individuals, we love you, God, and we love each other. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus, by your Spirit. If you agree, say amen. amen. Let's worship.
Oh, I feel 
love us even so much more. That you will go after us, Lord. That you will defend us. We thank you, Lord, for our unconditional love. Our loving heart. We praise you. We honor you today, Lord Jesus. Amen. I hope that you are all as blessed by these voices and all of our voices as I am. And it is such a great experience to come here and be centered by the worship and feel the Holy Spirit just put me in the right place. Amen? Amen. Good morning. I'm Mary Nicolette. I have a couple of announcements. Um, our regular weekly things are happening this week on Wednesdays and Wednesdays. Um, so just check the bulletin, and I won't talk about those here. Um, if you are new here, if this is your first time or second or third time, but you haven't yet visited the Welcome Center, please do so. Sandy Cushing would love to say hello to you. We have a gift for you. We tell you whatever it is you want to know and find out a little bit about you in the process. And also at the Welcome Center, we have a couple of sign-up sheets for ministries to serve in a ministry, or even if you just want to get a little bit more information about what that ministry is about, go ahead and sign up and you'll be contacted and somebody will give you whatever you need to know. Please don't forget to visit our script table. Script is a great way to support the church. So you buy gift cards at face value and the church gets a little money back. Kind of a win-win, I think. And this morning, oh, I'm sorry, on October 1st, don't forget the Walk for Life. Corona Life Services Walk for Life is October 1st. It's a great ministry. It's a great cause. Sandy Cushing is walking. And so if you want some more information, if you would like to support that ministry, you can talk to Sandy Cushing. If you'd like to walk, I'm sure she'd like the company. So it's just a great fundraiser. And last but not least, this morning we have with us the Travers, Paul and Lori Travers. Um, they are missionaries to, in Germany. They're serving... U.S. military serving in Germany and um, basically being the connection to the church for those individuals. And um, I would invite you to go over to their table and find out a little bit more about their ministry this morning. Have a great day. I definitely concur with what Mary said about worship this morning, just um, a good sense of the presence of the Lord. Uh, also, uh, Mary uh, did uh, introduce you uh, to the Travers, uh, Pastor Paul and Lori and uh, their daughter. Traver, Traver. I know how I feel when they call me John Bowes. So... <laughs> Uh, and I actually, um, uh, as Mary said, they, they have a table here. I just want to introduce you to their ministry. But uh, Pastor Paul, would you come up and want to have you uh, just say a good word. Last uh, a week from this past Saturday, uh, Pastor Paul, uh, who, by the way, is Tim uh, Collins' cousin, he spoke at our, our men's breakfast, and it was uh, just such a great, timely word. And um, we, I don't know if he'll uh, go into it, but we, we have an interesting connection from years back, which we didn't know about. Uh, but when he started to explain what they did, I was like, wait a minute here. And so anyway, so we're also, uh, I just get a good sense of connected at the heart in the spirit of what him and his family is doing in Germany. And it is a, it is a great opportunity, a great ministry has its challenges, and uh, anyway, I, I, I'm taking too much time. Anyway, uh, yeah, Pastor Paul, go ahead and share with you a moment. Welcome. Thank you, Pastor John. And Edie, thank you for uh, inviting us to be with you all today. And can I just, I want to take 30 seconds and just jump on what's already been said twice, and that is the worship. As, as a pastor, um, we are pastors of a church in Germany. Um, we do church just like you do here and very much the same. And it's geared 
uh, or targeted towards our U.S. military. Um, where we are is um, Ramstein, Germany, Landstuhl Medical Center. In that area is 50 to 60,000 U.S. service personnel. So it's, it's basically the largest population of Americans outside the United States. So we, in our environment there, it's very American-ish or Americanian or whatever <laughs> you want to put on there. I know those aren't English words, but they just seem to fit. But it, it is very much uh, what you see here. But more importantly, it's about giving our military a place where they have hope. Um, many of you know someone who served in the military and there's nothing like being stationed overseas and being away from family. And of course, all of the things that they see is, is far and above some of the things we encounter individually here in the States. And so we've gone through a lot of stuff. We've had the Ukrainian refugees. We've had OAR, which is, I can't remember, <laughs> it's a synonym for something. But it had to do with the evacuation of Kabul when we had all of the Afghani refugees show up, we were only supposed to house 10,000 at the base. We ended up being over 50,000, and they occupied much of the flight line, and it was like having a little Afghanistan right there where we live. And for many of our troops and airmen, it was like being deployed. It was a, an incredible um, and life-changing experience that was very hard and left many of them traumatized. So I said all that to say this, that the worship this morning is very much like when the priest waves the incense in the temple and sets the atmosphere for worship and interaction and intimacy with the Father. So the worship was right on today. We are grateful to be with you. And as Pastor John noted, my wife Lori and our daughter Jordan, we also have a son who is uh, right now living in Waxahachie, Texas, with his wife of three years. She is a school grade teacher in the Dallas School District. And Ryan, our son, and her, they both graduated from Southwestern Assembly of God University um, just about two years ago, somewhere around there. So they're there and they're not with us. And so I would like to encourage you to come and see us when service is over. We would love to answer any questions that you have um, we would love to be able to encourage you to get involved in missions. Um, if you know anything about being missionaries, what part of what we're doing is traveling the United States. We're leaving tomorrow to head to, no, Tuesday. We're leaving Tuesday to head to San Antonio. And we're going to be in San Antonio. We're going to do just what we're doing here. We're coming to churches and encouraging people in missions and encouraging them to support missions and be involved in missions. But you are a... You are at a pivotal place as a church. Don't think that you aren't. God is doing something magnificent in this place. I sensed it this morning. I felt God's spirit praying or speaking to me about praying for you. And what I was praying for was that God would begin to pour his spirit out in a fresh way in this church body. And that he is going to bless the parking lot. He's going to bless this building and he's going to be blessing everything you see for the purpose of bringing in the lost. There is a hurting world out there and we are doing what you are doing here. Not medicating people, healing people. There's a difference, isn't there? Yeah. You're not here just to get an excitement and have an exclamation point and go home and think you had a wonderful weekend. What God's wanting you to do today is learn. Learn to the point where you shift. It's all about the shift. And God is shifting your life to becoming more like him. So we are doing what you're doing, and we just ask that you'd encourage us, partner with us, be with us, and definitely pray for us. Amen? Amen. Pastor John, thank you. I'll get out. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing. I uh, just set it down. That's all right. We'll take care of it. Thank you, brother. The connection, uh, it, it does warrant this. It's amazing. You know, it, with, with church, with church family, God's family, it, it is uh, oftentimes we find it a very small world with a very, very big God. And uh, 
when uh, Pastor Paul was sharing last week, Saturday, he uh, talked about, as he shared with you this morning, where they're located at, and uh, this was 2005, that Edie and I, you, some of you remember Pastor Dave and Sandy Tanner, we went with them, uh, we had a, a mission ministry there in Landstuhl, uh, a coffee shop that our son Johnny and our core group, our young adults group, had developed uh, in connection with kind of a, you know, in partnership with the Assemblies of God that they pastor now. And, uh, and it was, it went very, very well. You know, the service people going in, people were getting saved, free coffees, all of that, worship. And uh, when he started to share uh, where they were from, I mean, it obviously it clicked. And just, it, it just um, amazes me how, how God connects us. And, uh, and again, I'm reminded today that God is by no way, shape, or form limited by anything, especially geography. He is a, an omnipotent and omniscient God. Uh, this morning as we uh, continue in our series, uh, Ignite Your Faith, uh, <laughs> personally, uh, and it's not that this doesn't happen on Sunday mornings often or most of the times, but uh, th through this series, Ignite Your Faith, and in all actuality, uh, having uh, uh, other churches doing it within friends, but the, the springboarding a bit off of this book from this, uh, this author, and uh, 40 verses to ignite your faith. Uh, reading the book, reading it through, and then going into it again, uh, my faith is ignited. Uh, what you shared this morning, Pastor Paul, uh, the refreshing and the renewing. Our parking lot. When he said our parking lot, I'm thinking about Ingrid and the parking lot ministry and how many people haven't, how many families and individuals have, haven't been ministered to, prayed for as they come in, that opportunity, and bags of groceries. And I mean, and it's still happening um, during the COVID time. You know, it was... It was uh, such a, a kind of the tip of the spear with our uh, our opportunity with the the community and uh, and so so grateful so grateful uh, for Ingrid and her continuing in the, the missions ministry and it's so much a part of yes it's this is wonderful we we are so blessed with our facility you know I, honestly it, uh, it, it's a rarity that I don't drive by or drive up that I don't think, what a blessing this is. What an amazing uh, opportunity we have. And what, uh, dare I say it, what potential God continues to give us. And by God's Spirit leading us, the, again, open doors and open opportunities as, uh, as the Lord wills it. And a, a huge part of that, like what Ingrid with missions ministry and the other ministries we have that reach out of this place, faith, faith, faith to know that God's implanted and invested his spirit in us to lead us and guide us and direct us, convince us. And when we step out in faith, we make that step. Like last week, we talked about this. Oftentimes, the sign comes after we step out in faith. We oftentimes go to God first and say, give me a sign. Let me know this is really you and all of that. And let me know that this is the right direction. And if you do, I'll go. But God says, no, you take the step first and then I'll show you. Like he did with Moses. We kind of know the results of that, don't we? Led the people out of bondage. This morning we're continuing in this same focus and talking about uh, actually probably a pretty familiar, at least the, one of the verses, Jeremiah 29, 11. You know the one for I know the plans I have for you? But often, oftentimes we do this. We'll, uh, we'll kind of do a, a cherry picking of scriptures where this one fits, so I'll pick this one. And this one fits. And I, I've used this term before, and I'm not so sure that, well, like a spiritual buffet. 
we just go through and pick what we want and what we choose, and this applies. I'm, I'm uh, hungry and thirsty for this. This, yeah, I got an appetite for this. But in essence, the, the, the Lord says in his word, we should have an appetite for the whole book. Genesis to Revelation. That's our appetite. And so this morning in talking, I want to uh, use, go to the verses prior to Jeremiah 29. 11. In other words, the context of it. Why was it written? To whom it was written? Where it was written? And the purpose behind it, always the purpose. You know this, right, loved ones? God is all about plan and purpose. Nothing but nothing but nothing happens. That's a surprise to God. But nothing but nothing happens without God's plan and purpose. God is in control. He always has been, and he always will be. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to go to Jeremiah 29. And uh, we're going to talk about something this morning. It's, uh, we're going to talk about exile. It's not a word we use very often, is it? Uh, especially, uh, I would say, in our culture. Uh, in certain cultures, definitely. You know, I uh, was kind of doing some research on uh, kingdoms. You know, uh, countries that are kingdoms, you'll hear the term and Historically, you'll see that there's been uh, some pretty predominant exiles over the years. And uh, I, I don't want to get into too much of that this morning, but just the terminology of exile, and it means you're kicked out. Essentially is what you're kicked out, brought out, cast out, whatever semantic you want to use, the bottom line is you're displaced. And... This is the scripture this morning, the context this morning, that God's people were displaced. They were in exile. And so when Jeremiah, who, by the way, was considered the weeping prophet, because uniquely enough, by, by what we read about Jeremiah's life in the time of Jeremiah, one could say it wasn't the most successful of prophets. He wasn't well listened to. Uh, the, the people rebelled against the word of the Lord that came through him. There were so many things that, you know, Jeremiah could have said, that's it, I'm done. You people, you stiff-necked people, I'm not, I, why? Why do I even open up my mouth? And isn't it interesting that he's one of today, and has been for, for many, many years, one of the most quoted prophets. And one of, the, one of the books in the Bible, the Old Testament, that we, glee, we can glean so much promise and faith from an example. So here in Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord, says, the Lord sends Jeremiah to his people, and, uh, and they've been going through it. They've been exiled. Uh, they were actually uh, kicked out of the land taken captive by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was a very, you probably know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar was an interesting king. And so he takes God's people, holds them captive, and takes them to Babylon. So here they're in Babylon, and, and uh, they're living in exile. They're not living in the land. What God has called, what God has promised to them, not only called, but what God has promised to them. You ever been in that spot? where you're not, you, you know that you're just not in the place where God really, where you think, you think God wants you. God promised this to you. God, God gave you a promised land, a promised job, a promised house. And the next thing you know, it's gone. And you're thinking to yourself, this can't be God. It could be the harsh, harshness of life, uh, the, our economics, our, our uh, choices. The bo bottom line is, here in Scripture, and this isn't the only spot, loved one, but for this morning's purposes, here in Scripture, we find that this is a God thing. And as often, God things, being the very best of good things, aren't always the easiest things. And here we see 
and we read the account in Jeremiah where Jeremiah comes to the people and he has a word of the Lord. For a prophet, maybe some of you know this, maybe some don't, but for a prophet to come and say, Thus saith the Lord. It better be, Thus saith the Lord. Because if a prophet was ever found not to be speaking the voice of God, he was stoned. It was a serious thing when, when someone, when a prophet gave a prophecy directly from the Lord. And we see that here with Jeremiah. In the fourth verse, it starts out this way. So says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the captives whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Walk with me through these scriptures this morning. The Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabaoth. It means the Lord of heaven's armies. And then he says, and the God of Israel, Yahweh. Those are the two translations of the compound names of God. Very descriptive that Jeremiah brings the word from the God, some of it says, and angels' armies, but the God of heaven's armies and the Lord God of Israel. So essentially when he comes, he says, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm here in, in, on behalf of, with a word from, the one who's in charge of heaven's armies. In other words, the warrior God, the powerful God, the God that everyone submits to, the God that can control everything, that when I fight wars and battles, I win. And, I, and he could have well, just as well said, and maybe that was part of it. But he was giving one of his names through Jeremiah saying, you remember what I did to get you to the land of Canaan, right? To the promised land. God continues to say that to us loved ones, reminding us, remember what I've done. We talked about that last week again. Remember what I've done for you in the past. What would make you think I wouldn't do it now and in the future? Because my Bible, my word says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then he says, also, I'm the Lord God of Israel. I'm Yahweh. There's no other name above my name. And it was a very, I mean, it was a very sacred and holy name of God. In fact, for a long season, in fact, maybe even still now, for a long season, it was a name that was not uttered by anybody other than the priests because it was so sacred and so holy. Why was that? Because it talked about his relationship with his people. I am God, and you are my people. So he comes, Jeremiah comes in that name. So he's kind of saying, I've got some weight behind what I'm about to say to you. Verse 5. Now remember, they're in exile. He says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives, verse 6, and have sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease in number. Verse 7, seek peace and well-being for the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its peace, its well-being, you will have peace. You know, reading this, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of oftentimes put my own self in that place. The people are in exile. They're not happy. You know, and if, if anything, if you've ever been in a place where you're not happy, you know the anxiety that can take place, the emotions, uh, the, the desperation. Desperate people make desperate decisions. All of, the, all of what in, entails when we're in a place where I, this is not right, this can't be right. And yet, God tells them, settle down, build houses. Plant gardens. In fact, the planting of the gardens, if you read, if you read in the language and in, in the way it was written in the inflections of it, it was uh, plant their gardens. It means gardens to share. 
And it, it means it's talking about connectivity. So it's not only, you know, you're in exile. You're going to go through this, but you're going to go through this together. But again, build houses. It's going to be a while. And then also, get married. Have your kids get married. Have your kids get married. And here's another thing. And this is, maybe this was the most challenging. And pray for the place that you're in exile. Pray for peace. You know, uh, come on, loved one. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, that really, it's come as like a smack in the face. It's like you, you're all of this, and we were so happy and so good in the land which the Lord thy God has given us, and then we're in exile. And by the way, they were in exile because of some of the choices they made. They were the consequences they were suffering and enduring. And that, that deserves to be said. That every, I mean, God is a God of grace and mercy. But when we make bad choices, loved one, there are consequences. It, it does not take away from God's grace and mercy. And sometimes, God in his love, and quite frankly, in God's plan and purposes, he'll rescue us. But more often than not, and not without a show of hands this morning, I'm sure many, maybe most of you, have gone through those times in your life where you're thinking, what is up with this? Get me out of this, God. Somehow, some way, prayer is like, I don't want to stay here. When the very thing, when you look back on it, in those moments, those times, that season, you look back and go, that's exactly where God wanted me. Because of what I learned there. Of what the Lord taught me. Through my experience there. And loved one, as we see, this is what God wanted for his people then, and this is what God always wants for his people now. Relationship. Staying engaged and connected. Not disconnected, but staying connected. And not only with God, not only Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but with each other as well, and how important that is. Remember, God is always the God of relationship. The children, the reason why I believe that God, through Jeremiah, was telling them about generations is because, you know, some of them, as well as we read on, some of them, in the years that they spent in bondage, they were going to die in bondage. That's a tough one. There was going to be a good generation that passed. And God knew that. And God wanted their children and their children's children, and quite frankly, possibly their children's children's children, to continue. He asked them. He told them. Increase. Don't decrease. Increase. Have kids. Grow. Build houses. Grow. Grow food. And grow families. He said, I'm going to have you stay. But I also have you stay with promise. And loved one, that's not changed either. When God has us in a place, particularly in a challenged place, in a tough place, in a rough place, God's saying stay, but there's always a promise. God never leaves us hanging. There's always that, I want you to do this. I want you to go there. I want you to be this. And this is why. This is the promise. This is the reward. This is, what, this is what I'm after, with you and in you. Verse 11. For I know the plans and the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster. And to give you a future and a hope. It's interesting. Again, the language in it, in it was the way it was written. The plans. The plans... Typical God. I have divine design over the reason why this is happening. But I, I, I take, it's just this great comfort in this that the, the word for thoughts there was so personal and, and, and one of great consideration. In other words, you know, in the midst of all that they were going through, Jeremiah comes to them and he tells them in the promise, he says, God's telling you, he's got plans in all of this. Take comfort, take strength and encouragement from this, loved ones. He's got plans, and he's got thoughts towards you. 
In other words, they're not just plans. They're, you know, loved one, you, you've got to know this. There's no, God just doesn't make plans without taking mankind into consideration. You remember how much he loves us. Remember how often in Scripture he says, you're just the best to me. I love you. I gave my son for you. There was, there's so much that God has poured into us. And this is, a, this is a perfect example when God says, the thoughts I have towards you. And it's not the only time in Scripture. How many times hasn't God reminded us? And especially in those times where maybe it's a bit of a challenge, it's a bit of a struggle, where in essence the Lord is saying, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about you. Don't forget. And then he says, Straight up, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Never, never. And knowing the confidence and the comfort we can take in that. And here, he's saying it through Jeremiah to his people. I have plans for you, and I have thoughts towards you as well. Plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster. But God, don't you see what we're in? I mean, as an individual, as a family, as a nation, God, don't you see where we're at? Yeah, but you've got a future and a hope. It's interesting, it, again, with the context. You know, in the New Testament, when we consider hope, we consider it our eternal home. It's Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. It's we look towards heaven. Heaven is our hope. And it's not hope like often we can consider. It's just like, I, yeah, I, I kind of hope that happens. No. When God says a hope, it's different. Because it, that hope is a promise. A promise is for every Christ follower, there's heaven. There's eternal, eternal existence with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And here, though, when he says hope, he's talking about hope for deliverance. He's talking about hope in the now. He's talking about, you got to know that this is temporary. Verse 11, it's, it's a promise, and in essence, to say this is temporary. Again, I don't want you to show your hands, or and I'm not asking for that. But I'm asking you to look inside. I, would, I think it's a, a, a good probability that everyone in here has experienced those seasons. Whether it be an hour, or a day, or a week, or a month, or a year, when you thought to yourself, I do not want to be here. Or maybe even, why am I here? What did I, <laughs> ask yourself, what did I do to deserve this? And open yourself up to the Holy Spirit and His opportunity to speak to you. Maybe bring some confirmation. Maybe bring some conviction. Always bringing convincing. And maybe the Lord has spoken to you why. And maybe you're in the midst of it now. And here's another one, loved one. There's a good possibility it may be coming. Because never forget, loved one, God's all about relationship with us. God wants you and I to have the closest, deepest, highest and widest relationship with him because that's why we were created. We're created for community. We're created to be a part of the family of God as we are created to be a part of his family here. We're created for community. But we want out. We want out of that moment. We want out of that season. We went out of that time, and boy, do we look for a way. And we get focused. God may want you to focus your attention where he has you right now, but what we do is we focus on getting out in one way, shape, or another out of the situation we're in now when God says, I want you to stay here, and I want you to take that focus. Take the prayer focus honestly. Take the prayer focus to be rescued out of it, to see what... You need to see in it and need to learn what you need to learn in it. That's a hard one. And in and of our own strength? Nah. 
Nah. Personally, nah. But with God, the Holy Spirit, yeah, every bit so. Every bit so. We've been through a few things over our years together. Ministry, church, life, family. Still here. Still here. And it's God. It's a God thing. God gets all the glory. The Bible says it clearly. If there's anything good in my life, God, it's you. Verse 5, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Where you're here for the duration, loved ones. Sometimes God will say that. Listen, this is what I want you to do. You're here in this spot for the duration. I've got a plan. Here for the duration. And God gets done what God wants to get done. How many of you would agree with that? Where oftentimes we pray for rescuing. Where oftentimes we're saying, how can I, what, what can I do to, what can I do to speed the process up? And God says, listen, settle down. And you pray, I want out of here. Settle down. Settle down. Focus on the prayer of what I'm doing through you right now. The Israelites, sadness and discouragement and depression. God's plan, build houses and settle in. For thus saith the Lord, this is verse 10, just before verse 11. For thus says the Lord, again, Jeremiah uses that terminology, that preface, as he's about to say, when 70 years of exile have been completed for Babylon, I will visit, inspect you, and keep my good promise to you to bring you back to this place. He was telling them a timeline. Rarely does God do that. He was telling them 70 years. And the people, especially the older people, even the middle-aged people that were hearing his voice through Jeremiah knew, I probably won't see that time. Think about I think about that. How would I have handled that? I don't think I'd have been real happy about that. But yet they needed to settle in. This is just a thought I have. And I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord. This is just a thought I had. And it comes from being, comes from being a parent and a grandparent and a great-grandparent. Don't we really want our best for our kids? And our kids' kids? And for some, our kids' kids' kids? And maybe for others, our kids' 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 kids? Remember, the Lord talks about the third and fourth generation thereof. God's big on generations, y'all. When I think about the things that God does through us now, looking towards the future for our children and our children's children and our children's children's children, and how important it is, and how it's such a God thing. And here God is telling them, and I really believe that there were some, that there was a glimmer of hope that came through that, that they thought maybe, you know, it sounds like I'm, I'm probably not going to see the deliverance. But my kids are, and my grandkids sure are. And my great-grandkids are going to grow in the land of promise. That must have been a real encouragement. I would have thought so. God didn't want them to live waiting to be rescued. How many times, loved one, don't we just live wanting to be rescued? When we think about the now and the stuff that's going on, God, I just want out of here. I just want to, I just want to, I want it done. And the Lord says, be patient. Know that I'm doing something. It's kind of like the, I, I, as it is in our house, how do you respond when somebody says to you, well, just settle down. How do you respond when somebody says, yeah, well, you know what? Hey, don't be so anxious. And we know that it's the truth. The word is said in truth. But there's just something that's just like, you kind of, you kind of rise up a little bit like, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me to settle down. It's like kids. You know, those of you that are teaching, I think of Holden. That's a great example. VBS, those of you that in VBS know this. Eyes on me, eyes on you. And that's his way of saying, settle down. Settle down. Focused attention. God's kind of saying the same thing. Eyes on me, my eyes on you. I want you to settle down in this 
got to plan through all of it. A place we don't want to be physically, emotionally, spiritually. But sometimes we just need to slow down to see. You ever find yourself, you, you, you look back on your day, on your week, and you think, and something comes up that somebody says, well, hey, I saw you this week, or this or that, or hey, I saw you. I had not a clue. I must have missed that. I was thinking about, uh, and Edie and I are traveling in the car, and, uh, you know, for those of you who know her, she's a picture taker. And uh, if it's not family, it's scenery, it's events, it's all that stuff. She's, you know, I've had to buy storage on our phones. Lots of storage on our phones. God, God help us when there's the time that needs to be backed up. But she takes pictures, and I, invariably, I'm driving along, I'm doing the speed limit. You know my message last week. I'm doing the speed limit, and I'm, I'm minding, minding the business of the road, and she'll say, slow down, slow down, I want to get that picture. Let me get that picture. And I find myself in a 45-mile-an-hour zone doing 20, just so she can get a good picture. And I would have blown right past it. That's just not normal. I may say it to her, oh, by the way, when mom's with us too, because mom times travels with us as well, hey, look at this. And they're in their phone doing their thing. I'm telling on you, I am. And, and I'm thinking, no, not, and Edie often will say, wait, slow down, stop. Can you stop? I said, no, I can't stop. I'm on the freeway. I'm on a bridge. I'm, come on, I can't stop. But she wants the photo. Slow down. Settle down. Get the photo. Get the picture. How about praying to slow down? When's the last time? I asked myself the same question. And in developing the message this morning, I've had a couple of real moments. I had a moment this, with the Lord this morning, with worship. The Lord reminded me again, good, slow down. Slow down. What you shared, my brother, about the parking lot and about God doing a new thing. That's what God's doing. God is always up to something. And it's always for our best. And I want to say it's time. Pray to slow down right. The author says, and I quote, God is always in the present. And no matter what the present may look like, it's where he wants us to be. God is always in the present. And no matter what the present may look like, it's where he wants us to be. Exile can often be an excuse to isolate and disconnect. No. Just the opposite. How many people have felt, felt that God's neglected them? And then they leave. They leave church. They, they disconnect. And they disconnect from God. Loved ones, I don't can't tell you how many people over the years that I've had opportunity to meet and, and at times you know seen change and other times didn't where you know they were upset with God for something in exile in their life well God didn't do this for me God wasn't there when I needed him God didn't heal this person God didn't give me back what all of that and they disconnect and they handled exile in a way that, that wasn't pleasing to God. And that wasn't God's plan. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Sustainable with effort and God's help. Sharing with community and others. <laughs> I remembered this this week. I came across a, a letter that I had gotten. Actually, it was an email. And at the bottom, a friend of mine said, Don't be a bummer, be a blessing. <laughs> and it was after it was after he was telling me a lot of stuff going on in his life and it was something that the Lord had <laughs> he felt the Lord had told him the Holy Spirit he said I'm going to quote directly he told me don't be a bummer be a blessing <laughs> so he said I don't know if the Holy Spirit talks like that but he did to me so and it worked loved ones the place where God has us may not be able to choose what happens to us, but we can sure choose how we respond 
to what God wants to do in us and through us. We may not get the opportunity to choose, <laughs> to choose where we are and what happens to us. But we sure can choose how we respond to what God is doing in us and through us. Again, the author, and I quote, Are you someone who lives in the present, or are you often dwelling on what happened yesterday? Or what may happen tomorrow? Exile seasons. Don't just endure it. But live in it. Grow in it. Serve in it. It's another part of exile. A place where oftentimes it's the last thing we do is think about somebody else. Even though misery loves company, oftentimes we just, we isolate, we withdraw. And that is not a God thing, loved one. In fact, God encourages us to say, hey, get out of what you're doing in your mind, in your heart, and in ser serving in love, and bless someone. How often aren't we told in Scripture to give out of our own sacrifice? How to give out of our own lack? And it's a mysterious thing with God. And I know if you've done that, you've experienced, you look back and you go, wow. And even, maybe even in the middle of it all thinking, why is it that I feel so good at this? Feel so good doing this? Why? What problems do I have? Oftentimes that happens. Another mysterious thing with God. We'll get, we'll get into an interesting opportunity, a God opportunity, where we're helping somebody else who's in a far worse situation than we are. And that in itself think, you know, I don't have it so bad. If we even think of it at all. Because we can get so focused. I like to call that other-centeredness. When we get out of our selfishness and get others-centered. So I'll finish with this. Verses 11 through 14. The promise. For I know the plans and thought I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace, well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me, verse, 13, uh, verse 12. Then you will call on me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear your voice and I will listen to you. Listen, by the way, in the language it was written, it wasn't just that God hears our prayer. When it says this, the, the, the proper defining of this would be, I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to answer you. Then with a the deep longing you will seek me and require me as a vital necessity and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Sometimes it's just that, loved one. Sometimes it's just seeking God with all of our heart. When telling the Lord face to face, right now, in this moment, Lord, nothing else matters except you in me. I will be found by you, promises the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes, and I will free you and gather you from all the nations and from the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. For those of you that have experienced exile in the past, you know that promise is true. For those that are going through it now, be encouraged. That promise is true. For those of you, us, that may be going through it in the future, know that that promise will always remain true. God will restore. God will replace. God will refresh. And God will recover. And there will come a time in God's timing. And remember this, loved one. God will rescue redeem. Stand with me, would you? We have an elders meeting today, uh, ministering council. If you would uh, kindly think about that and pray. Pray for us this afternoon. As always, pray for that we hear the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he wants to lead us. We just need to listen to him and be obedient. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May you experience the love of your heavenly Father who will never leave you or never forsake you. 
And may you be grateful to Jesus every single day that he has restored access back to the Father. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Get to know him better and better. Become extremely familiar with his voice. And then be, <laughs> listen to him, and then be fearlessly obedient because he knows what's best. You be blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by his spirit. If you receive it, say amen. Be blessed, y'all.